Namaste. So it's a beautiful full moon evening. Moon is just coming up in the east. We just had a rain shower. Everything's auspicious. <laughs> I'm feeling high as a kite. <laughs> But I'm going to talk about that in a different video. This video is about the glories of Lakshmi Tantra chapters 10 and 11, which are about the three types of avatars. <laughs> Avatar means one who descends. So when God appears in a form, that means he descends or she descends from their original position, which is unmanifested. Unmanifested means not able to be seen by the senses. So if one cannot perceive the Lord or the goddess in their original forms, then they create special forms so that we can perceive them and worship them. And why is that? <laughs> so that we can approach liberation. You see, they have no selfish purpose in mind when they descend as incarnations, avatars. They descend because it's, it's actually an inconvenience for them, you know? They have to put on these koshas, these coverings, sheaths of denser matter and appear in a form that often has just the same properties as a human form, except of course, the spirit within it is not limited like a human jiva soul. So these three different types of incarnations come into the world at different times, uh, scheduled intervals actually, uh, it's not discussed here, but in the Srimad Bhagavatam, there's a chapter called Scheduled Incarnations with Specific Functions. So in other words, the universe is created like a whole, one thing. What we call past, present, and future is just a relative vision of the complete whole. So when the universe is created, it's created with these different avatars coming at different times. And so they all have the specific functions often linked with their names and the type of avatars. So what are the three types? The transcendental absolute forms, then the vyuha forms, and then the vibhava forms. Now, she's talked a bit in earlier chapters about the transcendental form. The form of Narayan is basically equivalent to Brahman. Just like in Shaiva doctrine, the form of Shiva is basically Brahman, Nirguna Brahman, without qualities. But when God appears in the world, this is Saguna Brahman. He or she has qualities. So where do these qualities come from? The goddess. Because Brahman has no qualities, no form, no activities. So the activities, forms, and qualities of the avatars are totally the goddess. She is the one who appears as these different forms. And we have to get that straight so that we don't fall or into the error of thinking that these incarnations are supreme in the same sense that the goddess is supreme. No, they're derivative. They're derivative of Shakti, the power. Now, the power originally comes from Brahman. So it's not like it's going anyplace. It's all in the family, you know. But the point is, she is the one who creates all these forms and manifests their activities. So 
This is the science of avatars. And these three incarnations, they, re, they uh, represent the bhava and the bhavat. And what is that? The state of absolute existence and existence, the principle of existence itself. Bhava means becoming. And we've gone over this theory of becoming, I don't know, a million times already. <laughs> when something becomes, it means it changes. It appears at a certain point in time, then exists for a period of time, and then disappears again. So all the avatars have this feature that they are basically impermanent. The, the principle of the avatars, though, the, the principle of absolute existence, bhavat, is uh, eternal and absolute. So you see, we're getting into areas of understanding that are really beyond the human mind and logic. You know, she says things like <laughs> these, uh, especially the Vyuha avatars, huh? And the, the view, uh, uh, what is it? Vyutantas, the secondary vyuhas, come in groups of three, which are expressions of the original four, but actually they're all the same. <laughs> you see, it's incomprehensible for us. We're used to thinking that this is this and that is that, and they don't mix, right? But when we're dealing with the supra-mundane, the pure creation, none of these rules of gross matter apply. So that means God in one form can turn into God in another form, but still remain the same. Even though he apparently has a completely separate form, activities, name, qualities, and so on. This is God. <laughs> this is why we worship God. This is why we adore God. Because not only God, goddess, you know, when I say God, I mean both. Because not only is God the most beautiful, the most powerful, the most wealthy, the most intelligent, <laughs> and the kindest, and so many other extreme qualities. Huh? These six qualities that she mentions over and over again, they include literally hundreds of sub-qualities. And these are all explained, for example, in Lalita Sahasranam. We're going through very slowly <laughs> the Lalita Sahasranam. And each one of the names expresses a specific quality. So the thing is, the transcendental forms include all of the qualities. And the Vyuha forms begin to differentiate these qualities into different groups. And finally, the Vibhava forms mostly display or emphasize a single quality, transcendental quality of God. And she explains at the end of chapter 11 why this is so. That among men, human beings, huh, jivas, those souls who are born again and again in samsara, there are different levels of intelligence and realization. So God manifests innumerable different forms with different qualities just to appeal and attract these different levels of intelligence and understanding. So people who worship the Vibhava incarnations generally are less intelligent than those who worship the Vyuha incarnations but the most intelligent of all, they worship the transcendental incarnations. 
because they are full with all the qualities. And it's said, those yogis, or she says right here in, I think it's chapter 10, those yogis who have attained the object of meditation worship the form of Lakshmi Narayan. Now, what does that mean? It means they've realized Brahman. You see, Brahman is not cheap. It's not easy to realize that one has to meditate in complete purity, in complete isolation, in complete concentration for a long enough time to burn off the gross layers of the mind and attain one's actual nature. Uh, because our nature is actually Brahman itself. And once you know yourself as Brahman, then you very easily can see the incarnations and their different qualities and the different levels and so forth and worship the appropriate one. In fact, you're not going to even really be interested in the lesser incarnations. You're going to go right for the top because that's the only one that mirrors the qualities you've already realized in yourself. So there is, of course, less intelligent people who pretend to be Brahman realized, but who actually aren't. And they're basically atheistic. They don't recognize the forms of God, and they certainly don't worship them. This is a big mistake. It just means that they're spiritually immature and they're pretending to be higher than they really are. The real God-realized souls, well, look at Ramana Maharshi, for example. He never tried to persuade someone to give up worship of a form of God. Never. Of course, if someone was at the stage of sadhana where they needed to go into the impersonal or void aspect of God, he would direct them in that way. But he had a very fine awareness of what stage or level a person was at. And he could very easily see how to encourage them in the best way to get to the next stage, whatever that is for them. So not that we should be rigid, in our beliefs, we should be open, broad-minded, flexible, and able to apply this science of God to any specific situation or person. So one more thing I want to mention, that in this chapter, there are many, many names of the different incarnations given. And these names are wonderful in themselves. Huh? I mean, it's, it's very powerful sadhana simply to hear them or recite them. And it's even better if one does the homework <laughs> and learns the history behind them because each one has a story and it's there in the scriptures someplace. Huh? especially the Bhagavat Purana or Srimad Bhagavatam for the incarnations of Vishnu and the Srimad Devi Bhagavatam for the incarnations of Shakti. These are the two, I would say, major, major Vedic scriptures in terms of the forms of God. In other words, the Vishishtadvaita Vada. The Vishishtadvaita Vada is the level of realization where one worships God in a form that corresponds to one's inner taste or nature. And this is, of course, cultivation of bhakti. This bhakti can, let me tell you from experience, can lead directly to realization of Brahman by grace, the deity whom you are invoking by your devotion can descend as an avatar and appear directly to you and grant you the highest realization. Huh? So don't neglect 
puja and worship and mantras, but and study. Huh? Don't be lazy. Study the Bhagavat Purana, the Srimad Bhagavatam, and the Srimad Devi Bhagavatam, and learn the history of these incarnations. Because simply this study, it's, it's hard to understand exactly how it works. But this will uh, lighten your karmic load and reveal the qualities of the personalities of the Godhead that lead to complete liberation and realization. Aung Tatsa. Aung Shakti Aung. <laughs>